Dr. Bones here, a medical man on a mission, a geezer on the go, and an old fart who's auditioning for a new part, and that's to keep you and your family healthy in times of trouble. Along with my victim for today, I see Nurse that. Amy. I have no idea what he's about to do to me. Uh, we are the authors of the Doom and Bloom Survival Medicine Handbook, a book that tells you what to do when medical help is not on the way. You can check that out over at our website at www.doomandbloom.net where you'll find over 250 articles on medical preparedness, survival gardening, medicinal herbs, gosh, all sorts of other awesome things. Now today, we're going to talk a little bit about hyperthermia. We're in the heat of summer and they're, gosh, it's Yes. In some of the hottest months. It's so months. hot. Oh. <laughs> All right, go ahead. It's some of the hottest months. Sorry. Uh, on record. Yes. And this is a situation that if things had gone south and the SHTF happened, then what would we have dealt with other than being victims possibly of our own environment without air conditioning, without electricity necessarily, and in a situation where we might not even have shelter. So we have to be concerned about hyperthermia, that is heat exhaustion, heat stroke, things like that. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about what you can do about it. Now, most heat related illness associated with the environment is pretty much preventable if you plan beforehand. Don't make any work sessions in the middle of the day. If you can provide a can, if wherever it is you are going to be doing something, provide a canopy for your people to be under. Make sure that you provide lots and lots of fluids. So this is a way that you can go ahead and take care of your people and make sure that you prevent hyperthermia, which is a heck of a lot easier than treating it. Now, hyperthermia when it's mild to moderate is called heat exhaustion, and when it's severe, it's called heat stroke. Now, with heat exhaustion, you'll find that people complain of cramps and sometimes will feel somewhat faint. In and of itself, this doesn't mean that they necessarily have heat exhaustion or hyperthermia, but they will have this if you check their temperature and you find that the temperature is significantly elevated. In heat exhaustion, the temperature can go up to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, people are going to wind up having a more rapid heartbeat, they're going to be probably somewhat confused, they're going to be breathing fast, they're going to have headaches, and they may even be nauseous and they may maybe even vomit. Now in addition to all of these things that I just mentioned for heat exhaustion, when you have heat stroke on top of all the rest of the things, it can get even worse. You can wind up uh, having loss of consciousness, you can have seizures, you can, if the temperature gets high enough, even go into a coma, your organs may malfunction and you may even die. And your temperature can go up to 110 degrees sometimes, I think uh, there have been recorded instances of even higher. Now, when you find somebody who has had a heat stroke, when you come upon somebody who's had that, their skin is likely to be dry. You would think they'd be sweating like crazy because they're so hot. But once you hit a temperature of about 106 degrees, your body no longer uses sweating or knows to use sweating as a mechanism to evaporate heat from the body. And so in that circumstance, those people will be hot and dry. Now, sometimes you'll come across somebody with heat stroke who actually feels cold and clammy. This means that they are already in shock and if that's the case you are in big trouble and you have got to act fast otherwise this person might die well assuming that the lovely nurse amy is one of our heat stroke victims today oh wait we, wait wait i have to say one <laughs> thing i was laughing while he was talking because i'm sure all of you have heard the bird has been incessantly talking the entire time. That's right. We have our parrot, and his parrot's called T.D. Bird. And I he was on your shoulder last yeah, time. That's right. He was sitting here, but he has not stopped talking. Yeah. So just ignore the bird. Yeah, that's, Are you want me to lay down? That's Am I your victim? You're my victim, but, okay. the, but we've already yes. done the first thing that's necessary 
to treat you in a situation where you might have heat stroke. And that is, we got you out of the sun. Yes. So we, a tent. so we already did the right thing. That's and so right. that, that was, I think, something that was very important. Now, and, with water and we're going to talk about that. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that in just a second. Now, what we're going to have, going to have you do is we're going to have you lay down. But okay. we're not going to have you lay down this way. We're going to have you lay down that way. That way? Okay. Because what you're going to want to do okay. is you're going to want to be laying down with your feet slightly higher. Oop. Whoop. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. Slightly, we're good. slightly we're good. higher we're good. than the level of your heart because we want the blood flow to be going to your brain direction right so so that's going to be very important okay the other important thing that we want to do when we see someone with heat stroke is we want to get their clothes off but you're going to have to use your imagination for that one. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know they got a pretty good look here already <laughs> well all right so i've gotten out of the sun and i'm laying down and my feet are elevated and i'm sure you were, have been giving me fluids the entire time well the thing is, is that I would give you fluids if you are conscious and awake and, and talking to me like you are now. Okay. However, if you aren't, and if you're uh, confused or Who am I? Yeah, or barely Where am I? or unconscious What's going on? or semi-conscious, yes. I don't want to give you fluids because right. they could easily go down instead of down your throat. Right. It can go down into your airway, and if you do that, that causes something called aspiration pneumonia, and that is even worse than what you started with. Okay. So what we are going to try to do is we're going to try to drench you okay. as much as possible with water okay. and to try to cool you off. We've taken your clothes off, we've got you in this position and mm -hmm. we're drenching you off as best as we can. Now, if we're lucky enough to have electricity, we're going to let's or battery operated fans yeah we might we use have lots of battery operated right. fans by the way right and we have rechargeable battery operated fans which That's with solar, right. char char I got solar panels. right so we're going to use a fan to also help evaporate the heat okay. now if we if we can't immerse you in cold water okay. we're going to at the very least use ice packs and but the thing is is that the ice packs have to go in specific places go ahead and sit up okay i was going to let you put it in <laughs> All right. All right, and we're going to go ahead, we got to get this thing to work with. Okay. Now there are special places where your main blood vessels are actually pretty close to your skin. And this is where you're going to want to put your ice packs so that there's going to be more efficient transfer of this heat to the body core. Those areas will be the neck area and will be the armpit area, for example. And it will be in the groin. I'll let you use your imagination on well, that. Well, you can just put it right here. Or you it's can fine. just put it right there. Right there. And she doesn't mind. Of Pulled course, it off there. Hope, if you don't have ice, hope you should have, as part of your medical supplies, lots of cold compresses or use, reusable ones there are and creeks, disposable. There creeks and, and rivers that have, right. have very cold water. Right. If you even have, if it's hot outside. Right. If you're in the wilderness and you have no other choice, immerse your victim in a stream but if you do something like that you have to be extraordinarily careful to make sure that you're monitoring that patient carefully well my idea was actually you could use those bags in addition to submersion but you could go send someone else to get the bags filled up with the cold water and keep your patient in the tent right you don't necessarily have to transport them to the the water source you could bring the water to them that's right aha alternative idea you're right. We're always thinking here, aren't we? Always thinking, always thinking. So if you can avoid dehydration, you're going to at least going uh, you're going to at least avoid the worst things that can happen with regards to heat stroke. If you can keep that person well hydrated, if you can keep that person cool, and remember during work sessions, at least a pint of water is necessary an hour an hour to keep people well hydrated. If you keep people well hydrated from start to finish, you're going to be okay. Remember that your percent of body water loss doesn't have to be very much for you to start having problems. Just 6% of the loss of your total body water content, it makes you basically delirious and, and uncoordinated. You're just like that guy in the cartoon that's crawling through the desert uh, trying to get to the, the mirage. So, one thing that's very important is to make sure 
that you monitor your workers and their workload in any summer heat activity. Now, whether that's in good times or bad times, that is just plain old good advice. This is Dr. Rose and the beautiful, <coughs> the beautiful Nurse Amy. Okay.